Now it's time for the ultimate batter cookie, the Florentine, a thin almond wafer coated in chocolate. And it really is all about the almonds. I'll start with a cup and a half of almonds. And I'm not putting this into a mixing bowl. Instead, I'm putting my cup and a half of almonds into a resealable bag. The almonds are sliced, so they're nice and thin, but I actually have to break them down a little bit further. That way, my Florentines bake evenly. I'll just flatten this. The easiest way to crush the almonds, just with a rolling pin. I wouldn't use a food processor for a task like this. It would just crush and crumble the almonds. Just looking to break them down a bit. Now I'll just pour these in a bowl to set aside. What makes Florentine batter a little different is that it's a cooked batter. I need half a cup of sugar plus two tablespoons added to a pot and a quarter cup of honey. And an ingredient you might not expect in a cookie batter, whipping cream. A third of a cup. These may be small measurements, but they have big impact. I'll take this over to the stove. I'm gonna cook this and on medium high heat, stirring it constantly until it reaches 118 degrees Celsius. Now that my mixture has started boiling, keep an eye on the temperature. Once you've reached 118 Celsius, you pull it off the heat and this is when you stir in the almonds. This will cool down the mixture a little bit and you'll feel it thicken up. Now that it's mixed, I wanna set this aside to cool for about 15 minutes. If I were to bake the batter now, being this hot, it would just spread far too thin and be so delicate and lacy, it would crack as soon as I tried to pick it up. I have a batch that has had time to cool. Like all of the batter cookies I've been making, you can make the batter ahead of time, chill it. With the Florentine batter, you wanna pull it out an hour before you want to use it. I've got my baking tray lined with the silicone baking sheet so the Florentines won't stick. I'm gonna use a melon baller to portion out that batter evenly. And it's amazing, it takes the tiniest amount of batter to make a Florentine cookie. When you're making Florentines, it's very important to leave lots of space in between your cookies because they are gonna completely spread out. The end goal of a Florentine is a super flat cookie that browns evenly. So to help promote that flattening, I like to press the little bit of batter down with my fingers. To keep it from sticking, I just dip my fingers in a little bit of water. Just flatten it a little bit. Don't worry at this point, if your Florentine batter doesn't seem to be a perfect circle, I've got a trick for fixing that later. It's time to bake the Florentines. I've preheated my oven to 350 and they take about 12 minutes. Depending on your oven, you may find you want to rotate the pan halfway through cooking to get that even browning. And here they are after about 12 minutes. See how much they spread? You can see why you need that space around them. Now at this point, these are quite soft coming out of the oven. It can be anywhere from 30 seconds to two minutes for them to cool down a little bit. And you wanna have on hand a two and a half inch cookie cutter and that little dish of water that I use to dip my fingers in because I'm gonna dip in my cookie cutter so that it doesn't stick to the cookies. And this is how I'm getting precise Florentine shapes. Just cut through. And now I let that Florentine cool completely on the tray. It'll gradually cool down and then set up nice and crisp. As you're going along with this task, if you find that your Florentines are setting up too quickly, you can pop the tray back in the oven, 10, 15 seconds, softens them right back up again so you can keep trimming them. I have a little dish to keep my scraps, so as the Florentines are cooling, I'm just gonna pull away the trim. The trim is just as delicious as the Florentine itself and just as crispy. Boy, once the Florentines cool, it doesn't take long for them to set up. I'll get another baking tray ready because once the Florentines are cool enough to lift, 
You can take them off of your silicone baking tray to cool down and set completely. And that way you can start with another batch. I find if you have two trays, you can get a nice even rotation. One's in the oven, one you're getting ready, you switch it out. But do let the pan and the silicone baking mat cool in between your bakings. That ensures you get an even browning. For me, a Florentine cookie isn't complete without a coating of chocolate. I have a full batch of the Florentines baked off and trimmed down perfectly. The reason I like to coat Florentines with chocolate is not just because chocolate and almond go together so naturally, but look at the fragility, how sheer that Florentine is. It cracks very easily, but it doesn't if you put a layer of chocolate on the back of it. So I'm going to set these aside and take care of the chocolate. Because the Florentine batter is made of sugar, if you were to store these in the fridge, they would actually melt. When a recipe needs to be stored at room temperature, you have to temper your chocolate. The process of tempering chocolate is melting it up to a certain temperature, cooling it down, and then warming it up a little more. That bonds the cocoa butter to the cocoa solids so that it sets at room temperature. The first step in the process is to melt five ounces of dark chocolate over a pot of barely simmering water. And I wanna use my candy thermometer to ensure I hit 50 degrees Celsius. There we go. When you're tempering chocolate, you want to work on a cool surface. I'm gonna put two thirds of the chocolate from the bowl right on the surface of the marble. The minute I add it, I'm gonna start moving it around with two palette knives. And meanwhile, this last third, I'll set aside to just cool a little bit on its own. So you spread out the chocolate on the cool marble, keep it moving, and then push it back together. This technique is called tabling. You wanna hit 27 Celsius when you're cooling dark chocolate. Doesn't take long. There I am, just below 27. So now I'll bring over my base bowl and add this back. And there it is. And the final step, once you've hit your temperature, for about 30 seconds, give it a vigorous stir. This ensures you'll have a shiny chocolate coating with no streaking. Start with a tray of Florentines and then something really special. This is a cocoa transfer sheet. It's a sheet of plastic and this beautiful pattern is actually made from cocoa butter. When you brush your Florentine with chocolate and place it on, the chocolate sets and it takes that pattern with it when you lift the set Florentine away. You find cocoa transfers at the same places where you buy chocolate making supplies or cake decorating supplies. I have my Florentine and I paint the chocolate on the bottom of it. Just with a pastry brush, you want a nice generous coating of it. Once set, a full layer of chocolate gives the Florentine strength. That way it won't break so easily. Since I've tempered the chocolate, it will set at room temperature and can be held at room temperature. Once you have your Florentines brushed with the chocolate on the cocoa transfer sheet, it'll set up over a few minutes. Once it sets, the last step is to pop them in the fridge, not for long, just three to five minutes. That's the final curing of the chocolate to ensure that it can be stored at room temperature and have that perfect snap to it. Here's a tray that's fully set so I can peel them off of that cocoa transfer sheet. And there it is, revealing that beautiful cocoa butter pattern and when I arrange my Florentines, I like to alternate. So the almond side up and a chocolate side up. These cocoa transfer sheets come in an assortment of styles and patterns and even seasonal designs. When you have the cocoa butter transfer, it really makes you look like a professional. But it's not just about looks here. It's also about quality. Get that lovely snap. And what I love most is the minute it hits your tongue, it just melts 